Welcome everybody to the New Liar podcast. I'm here with poet Daniel Leach, and uh, we're back for a special podcast episode on John Keats's Great Odes. We're actually in a very special, in a, a very momentous occasion is upon us, uh, Daniel, with the coming of the 200th anniversary of John Keats's death. He died in on February 23rd, 1821. So we're in 2021, 200 years later, and here we are still talking about this young man's poetry. So yes, yes, it's rather remarkable, uh, especially in light of, of how, uh, uh, of how uh, he was uh, uh, attempted to be suppressed uh, during his lifetime was, uh, attacked by the critics, uh, was relegated to obscurity, uh, works not published uh, widely, uh, and uh, thought to be, you know, to uh, Shelley uh, thought that uh, Keats uh, would, would basically be forgotten unless he did something about it. And so he memorialized him in his famous uh, work called As an Ice. But uh, here we are, yes, 200 years later, and he's uh, a touchstone of poetic creativity in the English language. Right. And I mean, there's so much all the more. I mean, I think that makes for a richer discussion here at New Liar. We are passionate about timeless poetry and timeless art and really exploring the question of what it means to create timeless art, timeless beauty. And I think this is a very important question, because especially today, there's a lot of there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of chaos. I mean, the world generally is right now uh, really in, a, in, in quite a, a milestrone of, of chaos politically, culturally, socially. So, I mean, in one sense, why talk about something like the poetry of John Keats? Why talk about his five great odes in a time like this? But, I mean, for one instance, uh, I, I have to just relating a little anecdote here. I went out today to get some coffee and I, um, you know, I, I was, I heard some young people chatting uh, as I was waiting for, uh, as I was waiting at the cash. And I have to say that I cringed. I cringed because if, if you, if you hear the level of banality, which is really sort of, I mean, it's not to blame anybody so much, but to say that uh, the banality that is sort of, infected people's minds and especially young people who are supposed to be, you know, I'd say young people are supposed to be awe-inspired. They're supposed to be excited about making discoveries. They're supposed to be excited about the future and, and about creativity and really discovering their own faculties, right? Developing their own uh, creative faculties. But today you see that there's really a lot of confusion about what that even really means. You know, what is creativity? It's kind of like God, you know, everybody's talking about it. You know, all sorts of people believe in it, but how many people really have, number one, a personal relationship with it in, in terms of really having insight and uh, into it in how to develop it within themselves and therefore in others, how to cultivate it and how to really bring it to full maturity, which is, I think, this is why Keats's odes uh, arguably are, are some of the most important pieces of poetry really written because we really see, I mean, Keats was a young, Keats was basically a kid. He was a young man. And yet he wrote these amazing, timeless, uh, true works of genius, just as a, as a young man, I, I, I believe he was 24 years old. And so I think we wanna take the time to really look at what kinds of paradoxes was this young man really wrestling with, Daniel? Well, yeah, I think it's important to, to, to just uh, step back and consider the context for this. Uh, first of all, Keats, yes, as you mentioned, was, was very young. Uh, at the time these odes were written, he was about 23, I believe, because he was 25 when he died. Um, and he was living in a time uh, which was not unlike the time we're in right now. Um, uh, it, it was a time of great political and social upheaval. Uh, you had just had the Congress of, uh, 
of Vienna, which attempted to uh, impose a cultural dictatorship over all of Europe, uh, the oligarchs of the day, uh, the Austrian Empire and the British Empire were attempting to control all uh, art, uh, visual, poetic, and, uh, uh, and musical. Uh, and uh, Keats was a member of a circle of, of uh, intellectuals, of artists and poets in England who rebelled against this, uh, 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 this dictatorship, which took two forms. One was uh, straight uh, social and religious conservat uh, conservatism, uh, which any uh, break with church and 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 uh, and royalty was considered disloyal uh, and would lead to uh, a result like the French Revolution, and that was kind of the thing they used. It's sort of like the way they use terrorism today, you know, to say any dissent, you know, uh, uh, against the establishment today, especially as we see here in the United States, you know, and you're you're a terrorist. It was very much the same same sort of uh, uh, attempted uh, intellectual dictatorship then. But if you wanted to rebel in a way which was acceptable, uh, uh, you became a romantic and were concerned only with personal feelings, you know, your relationship to, you know, to nature and, uh, and such things. Uh, but with no real uh, uh, view towards changing people uh, with, the, with the idea that they could make the lot of mankind better, right? Uh, which is what Keats and Shelley and Lee Hunt, who is their sponsor, or was Keats's sponsor anyway, and the other people in the circle were very passionate about. And you know, I could go into the uh, where that all came from, but uh, I think it's important to realize that this is what motivated both Keats and Shelley, but it's very interesting to look at the way in which each of them decided to um, express it. Uh, Shelley was a natural born political organizer and radical from the time he you know, went to, uh, uh, to public school. <laughs> he was in trouble all the time uh, and he got expelled as most people know from Oxford for writing a, a pamphlet on the necessity, called on the necessity for atheism. Right. And now, you know, you could argue and I have uh, in articles and classes that I've, you know, that I've done, um, that he really was not an atheist uh, 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 because uh, he believed that the universe was ruled by a, a creative, loving power, which Christians call God. But he thought that any attempt to uh, to have an orthodox um, uh, uh, ideology based on uh, on that, any uh, 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 any uh, systematic belief system uh, detracted from the truth of that. Uh, uh, so, uh, but uh, Shelley remained uh, committed to changing uh, the, the, the social and political order through his poetry, um, you know, throughout his life. Keats, however, took a different uh, track. And I, I think it's very interesting uh, why he did that, because he, he knew that, as Schiller pointed out in his uh, uh, letters on the aesthetic education of man, that unless you change the inside of people to make them better, more universal, more more human, more more uh, uh, capable of of love towards their fellow human beings, uh, uh, and connected them not only with all of uh, existing humanity but past generations and future generations, um, which uh, he started to delve into at a very young age. And if you didn't do that. You could never expect any meaningful uh, political change from just operating on the surface. And we see this today that the people, you know, uh, I mean, I, I can't uh, uh, I can't deny them their their uh, good intentions. But we see in the efforts to write political poetry today, it's pretty much, you know, dreadful stuff uh, because it's just attacking wrongs and making fun of, you know, the, the you know, the the uh, the other side. You know, and uh, very much like the poetry of, uh, you know, of, of um, uh, Dryden or Pope or, you know, the, uh, the, the, that English school, uh, but doesn't address this deeper question of what actually makes us human. And right. this is the starting point of, of uh, Keats's Odes. Um, 
he, he goes through a process. He unfolds from one ode to the other, different uh, layers of, of delving into this question, uh, all of which I think culminates in the, you know, in, in what many people consider his greatest poem, Ode on a Grecian Urn, um, and, and its famous, uh, its famous lines. But um, I think that's the, what uh, distinguishes Keats is that he, like Schiller, decided that he had to delve into the very soul of people and connect them to this universal human uh, quality. Uh, and this makes him very different than this is why you cannot call Keats uh, or Shelley romantics. Uh, right. And I mean, I, I have two points to make on that, that I mean, I think what you said is it's so important and I don't think it can be appreciated enough given the, the times that we're in socially, culturally, artistically, historically, and I mean, first off, just to, to make a, a point here about Keats and what you said about romanticism, I think a lot of times this question of sensual beauty, right, the natural beauty that we often associate with the romantic school, I think that's, that can be very misleading when we're talking about something like Keats's Great Odes, because they are sensually very beautiful, but that's not really what makes them so profound that's that's not really where that's not really what's driving them anyways regardless of how we want to describe them there's there's a higher impetus which is really keats is wrestling with these paradoxes of mortality but not only mortality but ironically mortality as a means of getting at this question of immortality and he's really investigating this paradox of what it really means to be human, you know, that there are what we might call incommensurables. We are, we are faced with the problem of incommensurables, of the finite and the infinite. Human beings are not just flesh, we're not just matter, but we're also mind. And mind by its nature is not material, it's immaterial. It has no length, breadth, depth. It doesn't really have any directly perceivable characteristics, but as I, 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 I like to use this formulation, just because something doesn't have directly perceivable characteristics, it doesn't mean it doesn't have any indirectly perceivable characteristics. And I think especially as we get into the odes, I mean, I think this question is essential that the ironies uh, that Keats is really generating, they're not, they're not material, they're not sense objects, they're actually immaterial objects of the mind. And it's the ironies among these objects of the mind that Keats is really uh, putting before us and generating through irony and metaphor. That's really where the essence of the odes lies. So it's not, it's not really a question of sensual beauty. That's very misleading. That's an effect, right? That's, that's part of what unfolds out of the process of wrestling with these kind of ideas, but it's not, it's not the essence. And I think that's especially important uh, given that even a lot of people today or, or poets or writers who write or attempt to write or strive to write what they call, what we can call classical poetry or formalist poetry. Um, there is this emphasis on creating beautiful lines, writing beautiful lines, but that's not really, I mean, there's something higher and I think when we're looking at something as like Keats's Odes, we have to recognize that he's not just trying to write beautiful lines. That's not where it comes from. He's wrestling with something much deeper. And we have to look at that. And second point, you talked about how Keats, like Schiller, and in a way somewhat different than how Shelley uh, was looking at things with some of the kind of overt political organizing, that he was engaged in and that he even described in things like his, um, uh, his mask of anarchy, or I think as he was trying to do with something like uh, the triumph of life, it's um, mm -hmm. you, you talked about changing the inside. And I think when people hear that today, I mean, there's so much uh, new age stuff and kind of, I don't know what you want to call it, but um, sort of, uh, flaky spirituality that I think, 
you know, saying change on the inside, you know, that can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, what do you really mean by change on the inside? Like, let's, let's be clear here. This isn't some kind of flaky, you know, just, you know, these, these nice catchphrases, if you have to change yourself before, you know, you change anything else. Sure. But I mean, what does that mean? What, what is a human, what is the nature of human beings really? What are the paradoxes that we have to face if we're actually going to take on a question like that seriously? Well, this is what Keats, you know, explores in the, in the odes, uh, which I think he, he uh, gets to a place, uh, especially in the ode uh, to a nightingale and then the ode on a Grecian urn, uh, that he has, uh, he has, has affected a realization in you, uh, the reader, uh, without stating it explicitly, uh, that you are, you know, you're mortal, you know, your physical being is going to, is going to die, right? But you possess a quality of immortality uh, within you, uh, which it, it can connect to, the, uh, to that same quality in all past generations, uh, who you are a product of, but are yet uh, also a unique individual who can then contribute towards that process of unfolding of human progress um, uh, into the future and give like a precious gift uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, that uh, to uh, future generations. And that that quality, that, that loving quality towards the past and, and the future and the realization that you're mortal and, and this tension between wanting to hold on to the, to the beauty of your mortal being, but realizing you know, that this is a far higher and more beautiful thing uh, to, you know, to realize your immortality was what uh, Keats was dealing with. Um, you know, he's, it, it, when he first starts out, he's, he's somewhat anguished about it, um, you know, the first several odes. Mm. Uh, but he, get, he, beca he gets to a place, I believe, when, uh, by the end of the uh, uh, Ode on a Grecian Urn, uh, where you feel connected to this immortal quality um, in a way that is, uh, you know, very, very few works of art uh, do. You know, in music, uh, Beethoven and Mozart uh, uh, do it in, in, in painting, but in poetry, this is a very, a very rare and special thing. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I think at this point, I don't think it would hurt to kind of take an example of what that actually looks like. And as a first approximation, I mean, we don't, uh, we, we probably don't have time to read all the odes, but I think Ode on a Nightingale frames the paradox quite well. You know, it's not necessary. I think it's a discovery or I, I, a, a decent way to describe it is that it's really a discovery and sort of formulation or situating of what this paradox of human mortality is and, and, and mm, the question yes. how to is. relate uh, or, or how to define this relationship between our mortal selves and the immortality of the species. Mm -hmm. So the only question is, I mean, I think we're both quite familiar with the ode. It doesn't have to be, uh, I mean, this isn't uh, a Carnegie Hall performance, but uh, I mean, I think if we just try and make the ironies somewhat transparent and to just give people a sense that, you know, there's nothing romantic about this. This isn't romantic poetry. This is very, very um, paradoxical, ironical stuff. And it really, it really challenges the mind. So oh. would, you, uh, would you like to read it or shall I read it? We we could do it. I'd be, I'd be happy to. I'd be happy to recite it. And uh, you know, I, I, the if the uh, people listening to this podcast uh, can pull it up and uh, look at it uh, as we're reading it, it, it helps because I think it would be useful uh, after I've finished. If if you would like to go back and pick out a couple of things, a couple of points in it mm -hmm. where this par where these paradoxes become quite you know poignant and show the way it's changing from paradox to paradox. Yes. Because this is really the com compositional method, I think is also, you know, you, you could do an entire several hour discussion of just Keats's 
his compositional uh, method because it really is what um, uh, in music musicology it's called thorough composition. Right? There's a there's an idea stated in the in the very beginning. It's driving towards the uh, the completion of that idea by unfolding in each stanza a new a new process, but is connected on a deeper level with the with the underlying process. There's always always an underlying idea uh, that is not stated, but is finally uh, you, you become aware of at the end. Um, yes. So in very much the way that a musical composition like the Ninth Symphony of Beethoven does, you know, it's yes. stated in the very first lines, you know, the, the the basic musical idea, but it unfolds into this glorious, you know, sublime, universal, you know, ending, and then you become aware that that basic idea was there all along in the first couple of bars and these simple little, you know, these simple little things, but yet this, this incredible thing unfolds out of it, which mirrors the way in which our universe actually operates. And that's a whole other question we can talk about later, but <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> let me, let me just, let me just recite this and uh, yes, sure. then we can talk about it. Okay. okay. A nightingale. My heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains my sense as though of hemlock I had drunk or emptied some dull opiate to the drains one minute past and the lethe words had sunk. Tis not through envy of thy happy lot, but being too happy in thine happiness that thou, like winged dryad of the trees, in some melodious plot of beech and green and shadows numberless, singest of summer in full throated ease. Oh, for a draught of vintage that hath been cooled a long age in the deep delved earth, tasting of flora and the country green, dance, Provencal song, and sunburnt mirth. Oh, for a beaker full of the warm south, full of the true the blushful hippocrine, with beaded bubbles winking at the brim and purple stained mouth, that I might drink and leave the world unseen and with thee fade into the forest dim. Fade far away, dissolve, and quite forget what thou among the leaves hast never known. The weariness, the fever and the fret so here where men sit and hear each other groan, where palsy shakes a few sad last gray hairs, where youth grows pale and specter thin and dies, where but to think is to be full of sorrow and leaden-eyed despairs, where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes, nor new love pine at them beyond tomorrow. Away, away, for I will fly to thee, not charioted by Bacchus and his pards, but on the viewless wings of poesy. Though the dull brain perplexes and retards, already with thee, tender is the night. And haply the queen moon is on her throne, clustered around by all her starry fays. But here there is no light, save what from heaven is with the breezes blown through verdurous blooms and winding mossy ways. I cannot see what flowers are at my feet, nor what soft incense hangs upon the boughs. But in embalmed darkness, guess each sweet wherewith this seasonable month endows the grass, the thicket, and the fruit tree wild. White hawthorn and pastoral eglantine fast fading violets covered up in leaves and mid May's eldest child, the coming musgroves, full of dewy wine, the murmurous haunt of flies on summer leaves. Darkling, I listen. And for many a time, I have been half in love with easeful death. Called him soft names in many a music rhyme to take into the air my quiet breath. Now more than ever seems it rich to die, to cease upon the midnight with no pain, 
while thou art pouring forth thy soul abroad in such an ecstasy. Still wouldst thou sing, and I have ears in vain, that thy high requiem become a sod. Thou wast not born for death, immortal bird. No hungry generations tread thee down. The voice I hear this passing night was heard in ancient days by emperor and clown. Perhaps the selfsame song that found a path through the sad heart of Ruth, when sick for home, she stood in tears amid the alien corn. The same that oft times hath charmed magic casements, opening on the foam of perilous seas in fairy lands forlorn. Forlorn, the very word is like a bell to toll me back from thee to my soul's self. Adieu, the fancy cannot cheat so well as she is famed to do, deceiving elf. Adieu, adieu, thy plaintive anthem fades past the near meadows, over the still stream, up the hillside, and now tis buried deep in the next valley glades. Was it a vision or a waking dream? Fled is that music. Do I wake or sleep? Great. Do I wake or sleep? Great. Mm -hmm. yeah, it okay. ends with a complete, it ends with an ambiguity, but yet the idea being unfolded is not really ambiguous. Yeah. Yeah. There's, um, I mean, <laughs> there are a lot of paradoxes here. This, this is, <laughs> This is, this is the real deal. This is, I mean, we could say there's a lot of words maybe that we haven't, you know, we, first time we heard this, we heard a lot of these words maybe the first time. But even when we know all these words, I mean, even when we're 100% familiar with the, the elevated quality of this language, which is in many ways, it's, it's quite Shakespearean. It's, it's, it's up there. Um, mm -hmm. But it still doesn't leave us even having the definition of, of, of everything, all the words that were, were used here doesn't really give us an understanding of what the, the, the paradoxes are. And so I, I just, yeah, what you said about composition and Beethoven, I think that's so crucial, especially since there's been so much, um, confusion sown around this question of romanticism and, you know, what this, what is beauty in poetry or in art or, you know, and it's often just sort of reduced to a quality of sensual beauty. But here we want to look at the ode from a compositional standpoint, as you said, and instead of getting lost in the myriad beautiful images uh, which Keats does sort of weave and which are, are, are very moving and captivating. I think we, what we want to do. Well, here it's, it, it, pardon me, but it's, it's actually very interesting because he, he, he expresses in the beginning of this poem, a desire to escape into, you know, a simple appreciation of sensual beauty. You know, he wants to use it as a draft of vintage he wants to use it as a, as a, uh, you know, uh, something that that uh, uh, that allows him to uh, to escape, you know, what is obviously an un unhappy situation, you know. And he's, it says, "Oh, for a draft of vintage, vintage, right? You know, tasting of you know, flora in the country green, dance, song, you know, sunburnt mirth, a beaker full of the warm south, you know, all this, which is very, very, you know, beautiful images of of happiness." that I might drink and leave the world unseen and with thee fade into the forest dim. And, and then, he, then he presents what I think is the, one of the most powerful images of, of, you know, of, of real gut-wrenching uh, you know, empathy with, with, uh, with humanity. And when he says, you know, here where men, men sit and hear each other groan. Yeah. Where palsy, you know, where everything fit, you know, where palsy shakes a few sad last gray hairs, you know, uh, where youth grows pale and specter thin and dies. And don't forget, 
he had just seen his brother die, you know, of uh, of uh, tuberculosis and his mother. You know? Right. And young people were dying all over the place. You know, not un, you know, unlike the times we're in right now. You know, very uh, heart wrenching. Right. Um, right. You know, where but to think is to be full of sorrow. You know, even thinking, you, you can't escape the pain of mortal existence and leaden-eyed despairs where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes or new love pine at them beyond tomorrow. It just seems so senseless that everything, you know, good in life passes and, and, and is gone. You know, and it, 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 you know this is where uh, a lot of modern poetry just sort of states and then leaves you. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And this is where this is where this ode actually begins, in a sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's, it's by making the full impact, you know, the full breadth of that of that painful paradox, making that the conscious object of our attention. The yeah. idea is he, he wants us to he doesn't want us to run away from it. And I mean, I guess that's the question even today, you know, should we um, you know, he want, in this, should we go for the draft of vintage? Should we be charioted by Bacchus and his pards, you know, by the wine of God and his big cats, you know, his, mm -hmm. um, should we away, away, for I will fly to thee, not charioted by Bacchus and his pards. So how is he going to fly? It's, it's not by, you know, uh, it's not with hemlock as though hemlock I had drunk or emptied some dull opiate to the dream, the drains, right? It's, it's none of these things. And, um, I and it's mean, not the brain, it's not the dull brain either. Yeah. It's, it's not through, it's not through, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the, you know, the, uh, machinations of, of, uh, you know, of, uh, logical thought, you know, or even conscious thought the way we normally think of it, but on the viewless wings of poesy. Yes. And um, even there, again, you know, is this some new age flaky, um, you know, sentimental idea of poetry, uh, which again, just ends up just being like another kind of draft of vintage, right? It's just another, mm -hmm. you know, people that use art to sort of escape or they're feeling depressed. And, you know, they paint this super depressing, uh, <laughs> you know, scary, dark, painting and it's like that's their you know cathartic moment that's not that's not quite what keats is is uh is getting at here i don't think well in the in the next stanza he does something very you know it, 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 which i wrote in the article that i i that i wrote about this many years ago yes uh, is almost like a clairvoyant um uh a connection uh, with the physical beauty around him, because he says, I cannot see what's, he, well, first he states, you know, it's not going to be on the viewless wings of poesy that I, you know, that I unite with you, this, you know, this spirit he's talking about, which the, the Nightingale song, you know, uh, 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 represents, but on the viewless wings of poesy, and, and that even though the dull brain perplexes and retards, he says, I'm, he realizes I'm already with thee. You know, that, that just the invocation of it has put me in this place where I'm already with me. And he says, I cannot see what flowers are at my feet, nor what soft incense hangs upon the boughs. So he's not actually seeing these things. Yeah. He's, he's feeling, he's feeling it. He's, he, he's, these images are, are in his mind and he's feeling it with some super sensuous um, uh, organ. Uh, he, this is the imagination uh, which he's connecting with in you in a way that is just, I mean, the way he does it is just uh, so, uh, you know, you can, you can feel uh, the, everything he's talking about, the beauty of these flowers. And then, you know, when he gets to this point, mid May's eldest child, the coming musk rose full of dewy wine, the murmurous haunt of flies on summer eaves. I mean, it's just such a rich, voluptuously rich image. But don't forget, he's not actually, he's stated, he's not seeing this. He's, he's feeling it, you know, as if clairvoyantly and bringing you to a place where you're doing the same thing. And right. then he does something, then he does something very remarkable. After having done this, I mean, you could, you could end the poem right there and it would be, you know, a, a beautiful, beautiful poem. But he says, 
Darkling, I listen. And for many a time I have been half in love with the easeful death. Called him soft names and many amused rhyme to take into the air my quiet breath. No, now more that, that, than ever seems it rich to die. To cease upon the midnight with no pain while thou art pouring forth thy soul abroad in such an ecstasy. So in other words, he could just, being in union with this universal beauty, which he's accessed, you know, uh, through the process of this poem, he could die in, if, if it was in uni unity with this, he would have, uh, you know, uh, achieved a kind of an immortality, uh, or he thinks that he would have achieved a sort of immortality by unifying with this principle. But then he says, still wouldst thou sing, and I have ears in vain, to thy high requiem become a sod. Mm -hmm. So it's not about his personal union with this universal principle he's talking about. There's something more you know, that, that, he's, that he's looking for. Right. He, I mean, and then the, go on. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say what he does in the next, in the next stanza is truly you know, remarkable. Uh, right. Because he, well, he connects. Before going forward, sorry. I, I mean, I think it's, it's worth, there, mm -hmm. there's so much to say, right? And we, it, from a compositional standpoint, I, I think, well, number one, what you, what you just described, I, I think it's perfect when you say this clairvoyant, uh, vision. I mean, there's like a succession of visions here, in a sense. Mm -hmm. There's a series of transcendental visions, one vision being bored out of another. Um, and so in mm -hmm. this sense, there really is a rigorous sort of uh, compositional thematic development. And, you know, one theme is sort of giving rise to all these uh, new the themes. Seeds, generating. You might say the seeds of, of an idea uh, that's unfolded in, in the succeeding uh, stanza is is already in the previous stanza. Yes. And then that seed unfolds and creates a, a, a seed of a new idea. Yeah. And the, the stanza that you, you referred to, stanza five, I cannot see what flowers are at my feet. That clairvoyant sort of, um, this is really a transition point. This is like, the, it's a very transcendental, um, discontinuous moment in a sense. It's, it's, in, it's a discontinuity um, with what came before and sort of bringing us into uh, a completely higher realm, right? Which he fully then, he, he, he elaborates in more depth in stanza six, starting darkling, I listen for many a time, I have been half in love. He's really in, in a, a totally uh, different, uh, he's really in a complex domain. You know, he's really mm -hmm. in, this is not a, a sort of linear or, you know, just basic, um, you know, uh, materialistic idea of the world here. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, that's, it's, it's really something it, it, it can be, it's not obvious, right? What he's doing in a sense, but we can feel it. Something is changing within us, but uh, it really is worth appreciating the, 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 how he's doing this compositionally. If we're, if we're thinking about what is the nature of ideas and how ideas work, I mean, what he's doing here is really a revolutionary poetic act. It's a revolutionary act in terms of ideas. Yes, it, it really is. This is something you see in both um, uh, in both uh, uh, Keats and Shelley, uh, who both had a, a compositional method that does what we're talking about here, uh, that unfolds ideas from one section, you know, one uh, strophe of a poem uh, to the next uh, in this way, all driving towards, you know, uh, bringing a full circle only on a, uh, on a completely higher level, bringing the idea back to where it came from, but on a much, much higher level, having changed, uh, changed the idea uh, through its unfolding, but also having an effect a change in you, you know, the reader. Right. Um, I think it's unique. Now, you know, Shakespeare does this in his in his sonnets uh, on a much simpler and you know smaller way. Uh, I think that's uh, by studying them is uh, uh, a large um, a large part of where uh, Keats uh, you know got this from. But but uh, this he takes it to a level really no one had ever done before. Absolutely. And um, you know, and what he does at the end of this, towards the end of this poem, of course, is now he's, he's, he's made you almost in love with easeful death. 
you know, uh, in the way that he's connected it to the beauty of this, you know, this clairvoyant experience of union with this, you know, with this creative spirit that the, uh, the nightingale represents. And then he says, but thou, thou wast not born for death, immortal bird. No hungry generations tread thee down. The voice I hear this passing night was heard in ancient days by emperor and clown. Perhaps the self-same song that found a path through the sad heart of Ruth, when sick for home, she stood in tears amid the alien corn. The same that oft times hath charmed magic casements opening on the foam of perilous seas and fairylands forlorn. That this has, this is the spirit that's inspired generations of mankind, mm. you know, uh, th throughout human history. He's now made this much bigger than he, he and his relationship with the, you know, with it, you know, or death, you know, it, it, this, this is, uh, and I think this, this connection to humanity is what uh, takes us to another, you know, a higher level. Uh, and, um, right. and that's the point at which he says forlorn, the very word is like a bell to toll me back from thee to my soul self, you know, and that, uh, you know, uh, that this, this cannot last for very long but it can't be forgotten. You know, it's, it's, it's now, this voice is now, this song is now going over the, you know, the, the, thy plaintive anthem fades past the near meadows, over the still stream, up the hillside, and now it is buried deep in the next valley glades. The, the, the experience is gone. Uh, was it a vision or a waking dream? Fled is that music. Do I wake or sleep? In other words, obviously this has affected you as it affected him. So it's not, you know, this is kind of the final paradox. It's not really, I mean, the immediate experience of it may be gone, but it's not really gone because now it's inside of you. you know? yeah. And you're left with that strong, strong, you know, impression as you, you know, as you uh, finish this. And, um, well, it's really, I mean, I think you've said this as well. I mean, this really, um, it's a glimpse, right? He, he's defining something which by its nature, creativity really only comes in glimpses or what he calls visions. I mean, he uses the mm -hmm. word vision a few times. Uh, the, these things come to us, you know, and it's not like there's just, you, you don't just stay in this state forever. Uh, you know, it's not like a nirvana or something. Um, it's really something that has to be um, sort of uh, struggled with, but also that it, it sort of has to come to us and we sort of have to, uh, you know, we then become a vehicle. And so it's funny in the sense that it's gone now, you know, but what, what is this thing that it was here just two seconds ago? It's gone. It's not really gone. Right. But that glimpse, that vision has sort of uh, come to an end and having being at the end of it, there's this, you know, paradox of what is the nature of this thing that was just experienced. It's a thing he's he, he's making us, conscious that it, it as you said with we're aware of it within us now this is it's not it wasn't just some abstract vision it wasn't fancy there was there was actually a development of something rigorous there and um yeah it's just a so it ends on this interesting note sort of wondering right now you're you're left with the impression the very strong impression i believe that th this what he's talking about is more real than any of the things we see Mm. Mm. <laughs> or experience uh and it's also very interesting in that you know can you say you're happy or sad or any of the usual emotions we associate with you know with uh with being uh you know with being uh excited mm. uh when when we experience uh things you know we uh how does it make you feel it it, it doesn't really leave you in uh, uh in a state of of what we would call happiness or excitement or anything, but that yet there's a passion associated with this for, uh, uh, for, you know, being able to access this quality that he's referring to and to have other people experience it too. I right. mean, you know, the, the you know, the, the, this, uh, this poem, you know, my whole life has been a, a touchstone for, you know, for my, uh, appreciation of, of, um, of, uh, uh, of of not only Keats and poetry in general, but for a connection with other 
you know, human beings. And, uh, and it's interesting that this has, this has continued to uh, affect people this way you know, for 200 years. Mm-hmm. D- despite, you know, despite, uh, uh, you know, millions literally of words being written, you know, uh, uh, by, you know, stuffy academics trying to explain, you know, this, that, and the other thing, this, you know, uh, classical uh, reference and that, and, and, and many, uh, you know, I've seen many, many uh, commentary uh, attacking Keats and attacking this poem as simple, you know, simply spiritual gobbledygook, gobbledygook or romanticism or any number of things. But uh, it, like other, as you say, timeless art, has, has continued to affect people in a very profound way for, you know, for 200 years. And uh, I think it's, uh, there's a reason for it. I would even say that um, I think the greatest influence of, of these, that the, these poems uh, can have, has, it's, it's yet to be seen. The full impact of these odes on the history of creativity, on poetry, on writing, on the arts, it's actually yet to be seen. Even 200 years later, I think, you know, with the, uh, you know, the advent of modernism and the, uh, you know, the shift within in the, I mean, at the end of the uh, ni- 19th century, but the er, t- beginning with really the, the turn in the 20th century, um, poetry went in a different direction and the arts really went in a, a direction which was different than what, you know, Keats was doing and he was really reviving a, the, the tradition of Shakespeare, which had largely been uh, in, in many ways, or which had been lost as far as poetry goes. If you compare, there's nothing really quite like Keats's odes coming from the other romantics or uh, I mean, any poet before him, these, these are new. And I think the, the full impact has yet to be seen. And so, I mean, 200 years later, I- I, I'm I'm not worried. You know, I, I think these these. I hope you're right, and and I I believe uh, that young people in particular today, uh, you know, there, there's a very palpable desire, um, you know, to reject the, the the cultural and spiritual wasteland that the you know the previous generation has bequeathed them. Um, uh, serious serious. Uh, minds and and uh, among young people today know that there's something really uh so desperately lacking in you know our in our culture today uh and they're searching for something more meaningful uh, they tend to get um involved in all kinds of you know wacky things as you as you uh, alluded to earlier but you know it's it's important to realize that, that keats was 23 years old when he wrote this um uh, and, and his other great odes in which he was wrestling with these most profound questions of human existence and yet finding some, uh, you know, some connection to uh, humanity and a, and a passionate commitment to accessing this quality in other human beings that I believe if young people were familiar with these, with these works um, and, and seriously took them up uh, and, uh, you know, as we're doing, um, it would in, inspire them in a completely different way uh, than, you know, than culture is, uh, is headed right now. And I think, I hope you're right. I think if, if, uh, um, if we can do something about it to make this more uh, familiar to more people, um, particularly young people, uh, that's the effect that it can have. Uh, And this is why, this is why it is so, you know, uh, again, going back to what we were talking about in the beginning, why it is so political. Because the way that, you know, those who want to see society, you know, uh, uh, controlled by an oligarchy and not progress and, you know, human beings not to realize their full, you know, human potential and merely be, you know, uh, mental and intellectual slaves to a, you know, to a reigning, you know, uh, intellectual priesthood. Yeah. They fear, they fear people like Keats uh, and Shelley because they unlock this capacity for creativity in in, in everyone that encounters them. You know, and if it doesn't unlock them, they may not become a creative genius, right? But they know that, it's, that that's what a human being is. 
They know that that's possible and they can't be enslaved. Once you know what it means to be a human being, and that every human being has this quality that Keats is referring to here, you look at your fellow human beings, at yourself and other human beings in a different way um, that uh, uh, means you can't be controlled in the way that, the, you know, that, that oligarchs would like to control people. So it is actually, even though Keats decided not to be quote unquote political, he, I believe he ends up being more political <laughs> than most people can imagine. Absolutely. And uh, as you said, I think, yeah, especially for young people, I mean, these odes have to be rediscovered. And I say rediscovered because, I mean, basically, um, we have to, we have to get a lot of stuff out of the way that that's, it's not to, to really understand these odes. Yes, sure. They're complex, but in a sense, really the biggest obstacle is let's get all this um, modernist stuff out of the way, which a modernist reading of this kind of poem or romantic reading of this poem, that, that obscures the real nature of what Keats is doing. It obscures the real question of creativity. And I mean, I think just by getting rid of all these, you know, uh, the, these critiques and these modern critiques or these romantic critiques of the ode and just getting at this, getting at it from this ironical standpoint of what are the ironies, what are the paradoxes that Keats is really wrestling with? And as you said, what, what universe is, is Keats really um, demonstrating here in terms of, you know, what does this poem say about the nature of the human mind, about the nature of creativity, how creativity functions, and how we as individual human beings relate to it and identify with it. That's really the question. How are we doing that? And um, I, I, I think just that, if people think about that, read the odes a couple of times. I, know, I mean, I know I, I used to look up, you know, what's this word or what's that word or what's that word? You know, it's the, the language might be a bit uh, unfamiliar at first. Oh, for a draft of vintage. It's not like I, I'm gonna say that on a Saturday night, but um, <laughs> you know, that's, once we're Although familiar, be, be cool, I, I, pardon me. It would be a cool thing to say. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I, now I'm going to say it um, uh, to people who haven't heard the podcast yet. I mean, there's a lot of, there's so much that could be said, I think, because these odes, I mean, there's so much to say, but at the same time, these odes are very rarely heard recited aloud or, 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 or discussed, uh, recited and discussed, uh, or recited, I don't want to say well, I don't want to say that we have these amazing recitations, but recited with uh, mindfulness and appreciation for the kind of paradoxes uh, that we're talking about, I think that completely changes the readings. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of readings of Ode to a Nightingale, uh, of oh, yeah. Ode on a Grecian Urn. And there's a lot of bad ones. There's a lot of really bad ones. And there's a lot of just totally, I mean, God forbid the spoken word stuff. I mean, once you start to, to you know, get into spoken word Keats, it gets, um, you know, the, the ironies are lost at this point. It really becomes about, you know, the enigmatic sort of quality of the images and this kind of like mystery, but it sort of leaves it at this kind of uh, obscure, or how shall we call it? I, I mean, um, an, uh, enigmatic, right? There's a paradox there, but we don't really know. Or, or let's put it this way. People talk about negative capability. Keats coined the term negative capability when he was talking about Shakespeare. And they'll talk about how some modern critics will talk about how, you know, Keats had this idea of negative capability which is all about being uncomfortable in uncertainties and not reaching after fact or reason. And yeah, that's true. But then they're as if at Keats didn't care about fact or reason. No, it's that he was thinking it's, or as if Keats was an existentialist, basically, you know, he's just, there's mm -hmm. these mysteries, he's talking, ooh, so mysterious. Wow, so how, look at how beautiful the lines are. And it kind of just leaves, stays on that note as if these paradoxes aren't something that we actually have to start digging into and really um, unearthing, 
you know, that that just begins. Okay, yeah, there's a paradox, there's a mystery. Now let's really get into what this means. What does this mean about, as you said, being human? What this is, if this is true, what does this mean about us? What does this mean about our friends? What does this mean about the potential of, of the inherent innate creative potential of the human species? So with that said, I mean, this is a tough one, but the Ode on a Grisha, I don't know if we want to jump to that. Do we want to, uh, I, I, we don't need to, it's not a sort of conclusive, um, we don't, we won't, we don't want to read it on a conclusive note, but there is the same quality of paradoxes, which I think we, 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 we started to, we, we touched on with the Ode to a Nightingale. So maybe just, we could do this one or another one to see how Keats does this in another poem. What do you think we should do, Dan? Well, you know, as I pointed out in, in my article, and I and you know, it's my firm belief that all of these odes were one single idea that right. was spun off of a of a of a breakthrough of a of an epiphany that he had in in uh, eighteen nineteen that he unfolded first from, you know, the very first one uh, owed to Psyche, dedicating himself to the cause of, you know, of being the, the, the prophet of this, you know, idea of, of, uh, of you know, poetic inspiration uh, and to revive this ancient uh, beauty. And then unfolded, exploring some of the paradoxes involved in Ode and Melancholy and Ode on Indolence. And then with the Ode on the Grecian Urn, he starts to make this a, a, a universal and and um, uh, and connected to hu all of human history and to and to the suffering of mankind in the present and you know in a way that is you know we just discussed is very powerful and then the ode it's all leading towards the ode on the Grecian urn yeah uh, right which in which he achieves a certain kind of um, definitiveness on what he's saying which is not to say it's not still paradoxical. Uh, but he ends up saying something which has been oft quoted, uh, but it's how he gets there that's very, uh, very interesting that allows him to say what he says at the end of that poem. So, you know, it might not be a bad way to end to just, you know, um, uh, to just hear it. Right. Um, yeah, we could do that. I, I've sort of lost track of when we started. Um, we could do that. Or look at or leave it to another or leave it to another day. <laughs> no, well, we could leave that one for people to kind of struggle with at the end. I, I'm I'm looking at Ode on Indolence. I mean, we'll read one of them. Uh, I'm just wondering, do we really, you know, it's it's there's a lot of work, as you said, I'm because you said all all of them go together, and the Ode on a Grecian Urn is really, um, it it really has a conclusive quality to that creative process that we're talking about. So, uh, yeah, do we really want to jump to the end like that, or do we want to let people do that on their own and sort I, of? I, I would, I would encourage you know anybody who who's listening who really is, wants to do so to read all the odes, you know, in the order that they're you know presented in my article, uh, Ode to Psyche, um, being the first, uh, the the. Uh, the second one being Ode on um, or Ode on Melancholy. Uh, I'm just looking here. Um, Ode to Psyche, then Ode on Indolence, uh, then um, Ode on Melancholy, then Ode to a Nightingale, and then Ode on a Grecian Urn. Okay. And I included I included at the end to Autumn, which yeah. actually is an ode and actually achieves a certain beautiful um, state of, of, of union with this divine quality that is very, very interesting. It's, it's very, I don't think, uh, it's very underappreciated uh, and passed off as simply a romantic, you know, poem about autumn. I don't I think agree. it is at all. I think no, it I follows don't. from everything Keats did, but the ode on a Grecian urn is kind of where this was headed. So, you know, I don't know what what do you'd like to yeah i'll read it here what the hell okay I'll read it and um yeah just on on the ode on uh ode to autumn because i've actually i've thought about this as well so it's uh it's and i forgot about that we're we're gonna link to by the way for everybody we're gonna link to 
uh, your, your great article, uh, Daniel, Keats's Great Odes and the Sublime, which is really what has inspired this discussion and which we thought was worth sort of uh, taking up in light of this 200th anniversary of, of Keats's death. But uh, the Ode on Autumn, just as a thought, this is kind of a, it's, um, I, I argue that Keats's, it's, it's, a, it's a result of Keats having done all the heavy lifting, in a sense, that he did with these five odes. He's really in a sort of, um, he's gone through that whole process. And so I, I feel like that's him writing, you know, that's where he is spiritually able to just sort of reconnect with what he had sort of, you know, reconnect with the material world, but in a new way, right? With a new sort mm -hmm. of higher well, transcendental he's appreciation. Become, he's become at one with the spirit of autumn, which is is really the uh, the passing of things, you right? Know? And it's so it's it's very paradoxical, but very beautiful because he's become he's become um, you, you might say. Uh, 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 you know, death and passing no longer are are are, are uh, 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 something to be uh, avoided and and create anguish. There's something that is actually beautiful uh, right. because he's because he's realized this immoral quality uh, in himself. I think that's very much at the core of why to autumn, you know, is it has such charm. Right. He says something like uh, it has its music, too, or they have their music, too, describing all, you know, all the beauties of autumn. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a different kind of music than the, sort yeah. of, again, the quintessential romantic uh, theme of, you know, a singing skylark or, or you know, mm -hmm. nightingale or a field of daffodils. Uh, it's different. And it might scare yeah. some people. In a sense, it, yeah, it scares a lot of people. It scares us all uh, to a certain degree uh, at some point or another. But so, yeah, I think to look at it from that standpoint, given his maturation and creative process, it's, uh, it really is quite special. So with that, said, with that said, I'll read Ode on a Grecian Urn. And uh, just as a, a, a last uh, thought before reading it, again, this question of uh, recitation. I mean, we're going to be, we've talked about this. We're going to be talking more about it. Um, how to recite a poem like this, there is so much richness and insight uh, that can be gained from really, how, how are you gonna recite this to somebody? You know, how to go about this? This is a monumental task. I mean, I, I've thought about this for years and I, I, I'm not, I don't think I have it all down, but just to say that I've thought about it for years, literally, because it's not obvious and there are so many uh, questions that go into it. So maybe we can, we'll, we'll be able to touch on a few of those after reading it, just thoughts in terms of, you know, what, what's significant about this poem or, or how it's read. So, Ode on a Grecian Urn. Thou still and ravished bride of quietness, thou foster child of silence and slow time, sylvan historian who canst thus express a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme. What leaf-rimmed legend haunts about thy shape of deities or mortals or of both? In Tempe or the dales of Arcady? What men or gods are these? What maidens loath? What mad pursuit? What struggle to escape? What pipes and timbrels? with wild ecstasy. Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Therefore, ye soft pipes, play on, not to the sensual ear, but more endeared, pipe to the spirit ditties of no tone. Fair youth, beneath the trees, thou canst not leave thy song, nor ever can those trees be bare. Bold lover, never, never canst thou kiss, though winning near the goal. Yet do not grieve, she cannot fade, though thou hast not thy bliss. Forever wilt thou love, and she be fair. Ah, happy, happy boughs, 
that cannot shed your leaves, nor ever bid the spring adieu. And happy melodist, unwearied, forever piping songs, forever new. More happy love, more happy, happy love, forever warm and still to be enjoyed, forever panting and forever young, all breathing human passion far above that leaves a heart high sorrowful and cloyed, a burning forehead and a parching tongue. Who are these coming to the sacrifice? To what green altar, O mysterious priest, leadest thou that heifer lowing at the skies? and all her silken flanks with garlands dressed. What little town by river or seashore or mountain built with peaceful citadel is emptied of this folk this pious morn. And little town, thy streets forevermore will silent be, and not a soul to tell why thou art desolate can now return. O attic shape, fair attitude, with breed of marble men and maidens overwrought, with forest branches and the trodden weed, thou, silent form, dost tease us out of thought as doth eternity. Cold pastoral, when old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain in midst of other woe than ours, a friend to man, to whom thou sayest, Beauty is truth, truth, beauty. That is all ye know on earth and all ye need to know. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Even as I was reading it, I was thinking, okay, I could have done this different or, or that because it's so rich and, and one really has to think about at every line, right? The, as, as you talked about the, the overarching intention. There's so much going on that every mm -hmm. word and line you're reading, you know, how to, where, where is the best place to put the emphasis to keep things going? Um, it's really, it's really challenging, but there, there's so much to say. Um, I mean, I have thoughts, but what, uh, what say you, Daniel Leach? Well, you know, one thing that, that occurred to me uh, years ago, that was kind of a, a, a interesting um uh an interesting uh uh thing that he does uh between the uh ode to a nightingale and the ode on a grecian urn is he he's playing around with the the sensual experience of reality by a mortal human being because uh the subject of his uh ode uh to a nightingale uh is Un is heard, but unseen. Yes. The nightingale. Right? You never see it. He never describes it. He just hears its song mm -hmm. and implies its existence. So it's this vague thing, you know, that's heard, but unseen. And in the Grecian urn, it's exactly the opposite. It's seen, but unheard. <laughs> yes. Seeing these images, these frozen images on a urn, you know, from thousands of years ago that are speaking to him yet there's no sound right you know? and he's imagining the songs and he's imagining the you know the the the, the this you know spring feast that they're coming to and then he does something remarkable right which is the i think the essence of this uh, of this uh, uh poem is he actually he actually connects in a spiritual way and shows empathy for this town Mm. You know, that all the people that are on the urn obviously came from, but they're all now out in this field, you know, with the heifer, with the, you know, uh, with the garlands dressed and with the priest and, you know, and they're, they're going to have this, uh, this uh, festival and the, you know, and the young men are chasing after young women and they'll never be, you know, they'll, they'll never attain their goal, right. you know, because they're frozen in time and all this. But then he asked the question, but what about this little town that's emptied of its folk this pious morn? <laughs> and, right. and, you know, that will never see them return. Right? Now, it's interesting because the town isn't actually depicted. So he's talking about something. First of all, it's on an urn that, you know, that he's hearing, that's speaking to him uh, in unheard tones. Right? Those unheard yes. are, are sweeter okay, than those that are actually heard. 
So that's a paradox right there. Now he's talking about a town that's not actually depicted there, that's simply in the imagination, but suddenly has become um, representative, I believe, of all that has passed that will never be there again physically, right? Yes. Um, uh, and it's, it's, it's kind of heartrending in a certain way, you know? Um, uh, uh, you know, he, he says, uh, what little town by river or seashore or mountain built with peaceful citadel is emptied of its folk this pious morn? In the little town, thy streets forevermore will silent be, and not a soul to tell why thou art desolate can e'er return. It's very, it's kind of forlorn, but yet beautiful in a certain way. And that, I think, is, it, 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 that's the essence of this thing. Because immediately after that, after getting you to reach a certain cathexis with this, you know, hypothetical town that's emptied of all its folk, as all of history is emptied of, of its folk, you know, all of these human beings that went before us are no longer there, but yet they're speaking to us, right? And this is something that's very, you know, this, this in a way that affects you at a visceral level, you know, and deeply, I think a deeply spiritual level without preaching communicates some, the most important thing about being human. You know, we are connected to all past generations and all future generations. And, and that's what allows him to then say, oh, addict shape, fair attitude with breed of marble men and maidens overwrought with forest branches and the trodden weed, thou silent form thus tease us out of thought as doth eternity. Right? Mm -hmm. it, 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 it overcomes our, our rational you know, uh, thought and achieves, uh, it, it, it achieves a certain union with uh, the way that eternity itself does. Cold pastoral, when old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain in midst of other woe, the other woe than ours, a friend to man, right? Mm -hmm. and, and to whom thou sayest, beauty is truth, truth, beauty, right? He, he can say that. I mean, you could just say that truth is beauty, beauty is truth, and, you know, and it would be an aphorism that people would, you know, say, oh, that's very interesting. But yeah. he's, actually, he's actually achieved in this poem the certainty that that is true by getting you to feel the way you feel towards the end there when he's, you know, connected you with this, this little town. Right. You know, and it's, I, it's, it's, it's magical. It's absolutely magical. It's absolutely, um, yeah, it's absolutely stunning. I mean, mm -hmm. there are so many things um, that come to mind when, uh, based on what you were saying, I mean, there's a few different aspects of this. If we're talking about it first, because I mean, there's this spiritual quality that you're talking about and the, and the spiritual effect that uh, it, it, it has on us. But then also, how is he doing that from a, from a compositional standpoint as well, right? There's, there's, a, there's a deep underlying structure um, which makes this poem, uh, which, which becomes necessary, right, to express the quality and kind of idea that he's expressing, which, which is what you, you've been describing. And what you say about uh, the fourth stanza, right, about this little town. And uh, I remember reading this in your article. And it's such a great point, because in a sense, he's, he's, he does something quite revolutionary because he completely breaks away from everything that he's been describing, in a sense, and seemingly doing something completely different. But again, Discontinu discontinuous. Yeah, yes, there's a, it's a complete discontinuity. But as in Beethoven, right, when you're talking about these, these, these transformational moments, right, or in a sense, when you're almost like breaking the rules or like doing something for which there is no precedent in anything that you've said before, um, it, he does it in a lawful way. He does it in a, a deeply, uh, a, a very compelling creative way right, by just zooming into this little town from where, you know, we have no idea where it is, uh, you know, what town it is, but he just breaks away. And there's really a great degree of freedom in the way he does it, which is, is quite, 
breathlessly beautiful and extremely difficult to do um, and, and to make it work with the whole. And with that said, I mean, also what you said about beauty is truth, truth, beauty as some kind of aphorism, you know, I was discussing with um, somebody else about this question, uh, Fred Haight, who's a, a, a music scholar and also really loves classical poetry. And we were discussing how Eliot, T.S. Eliot, a modernist, and I, I mean, this is an example of what I think is, is very problematic with the, the, the typical modernist uh, mind. You know, Eliot has a problem with Keats's lines, beauty is truth, truth, beauty. He says that they're a, 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 bl uh, a blot on an otherwise great poem, as if, as if the lines somehow exist independently, right? The, the whole poem exists based on, is based on developing this idea. The whole poem is an elaboration of what he, he concludes with. There's no beauty is truth, truth, beauty. There's no poem without this, these lines. And conversely, without these lines, I mean, there's no poem. It's an integral part of the poetical idea, which is what you've been describing, that he, Keats is elaborating a timeless relationship shared by all humanity, right? A, 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 as doth eternity, right? There's this, this I mean, in a, there's this eternal relationship that all humanity shares. And I mean, if, if some people think, maybe some people think that's a bit um, fluffy or, or, or uh, flaky, but really, I think it, it really comes down to, well, do you have a relationship with the past? And do you have a relationship with the future? If you have no relationship with the past, you have no relationship with the future, you don't relate with the past, and you don't really relate in the future because you're, you know, living your best life or, you know, whatever it is, uh, you know, people uh, say today in terms of, you know, just enjoying, you know, you only have one life, uh, you know, just oh, enjoy yeah. all the delights, all the pleasures, all the, you know, entertainment that we can and, you know, get our fill of fun while we can, then sure, I mean, this doesn't really mean much. The idea of a, a universal continuity uh, across, you know, the history of the human species. Okay, then maybe that sounds flaky, but Keats is really defining a universal dialogue among all humanity. And I think it begs the question for somebody reading this, well, how, how am I gonna relate to the past of humanity? And how am I gonna relate to its future? And how do, where do I locate myself within that universal continuity, within basically within that simultaneity of eternity, right? That we're, we're acting on today. We're acting in history today. We're alive in history today, but history is a continuous process. You know, things of the past are still shaping today. And I mean, Keats talks about it. He uses just the, the, the Grecian urn is, is a predicate for that, uh, for, as a representation or a symbolic representation of that dialogue of ideas and culture across all humanity. But it's really, I think, Keats is identifying himself or, or, or situating himself within that. And that's why he's so excited. Mm hmm no, it's it uh, it occurred to me as you were as you were just uh, speaking that uh, you know uh, dogs lead their best life, <laughs> um, but they don't teach their puppies you know about the great you know the great minds of dogs that went before them mm. you know or what they might do to improve the condition of dogs you know in in the future. Um, this is something that's this is what being human is all about, and I believe Keats you know, really struggled with this um, and decided that he wanted to go through, you know, if, if you read the, the early odes, uh, a sort of gut-wrenching uh, uh, process of, of uh, how, to, how to communicate this to, to people because he wanted to give this as a gift to, you know, to, to everyone. And uh, I think that overarching kind of passion um, is really the essence of what makes Keats and Shelley who you know who did it in a in a very different way, but you know not so different when you when you look at the essence of it. Mm. Um, uh, what makes them so special, and why I've you know uh, uh, contended 
you know, my entire adult life uh, that it is just wrong to call them romantics. It's the opposite of what the romantic movement was in fact all about. And um, not to mention modernism, which is, you know, a rejection really of any beauty um, or any idea of humanity. Mm. Uh, so it, uh, uh, you know, I would just encourage, uh, it's a wonderful uh, a thing to do to delve into Keats, to read a biography of his life, to see how he, you know, he's, uh, uh, the struggles he went through in his very brief life, um, you know, very tragic life. And he was only 25 years old when he died, but he gave us such, such an incredible treasure trove of, of, uh, of ideas that, um, you know, it really is immortal. And I would encourage people to read a biography of him, read his works. Um, you know, uh, he was also, uh, I might say, uh, very different from Shelley in that Keats was not some uh, you know, effeminate, uh, you know, uh, uh, intellectual, uh, who was, you know, only concerned with, uh, you know, with, with, uh, literature and poetry. Mm. Uh, he was a, he was a very, uh, he lived life with gusto, <laughs> yeah. as they say, he loved, you know, humor and he loved, uh, being the society of other people. He loved laughter and, 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 um, and enjoyment and pleasure, uh, but he realized that there was something, you know, far more profound about, you know, the, the human connections. And uh, uh, it's very interesting to read, to read about his life and how the, these uh, great works, uh, his odes being his greatest came about. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, yeah, I, I just uh, encourage people to read uh, the Keats biography by Andrew Motion. It's really a... Yes. It's, uh, I think, uh, one of the critics said it's as if uh, Andrew Motion had a hotline to heaven, you know, talking to Keats. Yeah. He's writing this by well, he's, a, he's a poet. Yeah, and very much so. Uh, so I yeah. definitely encourage everybody to check out uh, uh, Daniel Leach's uh, article, which we're going to link to in the uh, description for uh, on Keats's Great Odes and the Sublime. I would recommend uh, da uh, Andrew Motion's biography on Keats and all the more I mean these are like great pieces of music these odes you can return to them I mean you're gonna when we return to them years later we find something new right there it's and it's always there's always this process of rediscovery just like listening to a great symphony over again many years later or something and having the biographical background definitely does even enrich the whole experience even more because you have a sense of where Keats was in his life, what had happened before, you know, what was to happen and the kind of choices he made and the kind of identity that he adopted. It's, um, I mean, it's one of the most important uh, and amazing stories in the history of art and all in this young man, uh, 25, I mean, he died when he was 25. So, I mean, I think that's a great place to end. And, uh, yeah, the Keats is really the counterpoint between a lot of young people today and the quality of genius that we found in Keats. And I think this genius exists in a lot of people. And unfortunately, it's just, it doesn't get developed or it gets led astray by the kind of, of decadent and popular culture that we have today, whether it's uh, intellectually decadent or centrally decadent, um, the, the, the popular culture is very destructive so I encourage everybody, sit down, read Keats's odes, read it with friends, discuss it, and really just have a, have a good old time making discoveries and uh, reading beautiful poetry. So thank you, Daniel Leach, for joining us. It's always a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And uh, we hope you will uh, join us again soon. Be glad to. Thank you, Daniel Leach. Take care. Thank you, everybody. For Good night. Listening.